In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, a reading from the mystical city of God by Venerable Mary of Agreda. Chapter 10, the Blessed Trinity sends the Archangel Gabriel as a messenger to announce to Most Holy Mary that she is chosen as the Mother of God. For infinite ages had been appointed the convenient hour and time in which the great mystery of piety, 1 Timothy 3.16, which was approved by the Spirit, prophesied to men, foretold to angels, and expected in the world was to be drawn from the hidden recesses of the divine wisdom in order to be appropriately manifested in the flesh. The plenitude of time, Galatians 4.4, 4, had arrived. That time, which until then, although filled with prophecies and promises, was nevertheless void and empty. For it wanted the fullness of the most holy Mary, by whose will and consent all the ages were to receive their complement, namely the eternal word made flesh, capable of suffering and redeeming man. Before all ages, this mystery was prearranged in such a way that it should be fulfilled through the mediation of this heavenly maiden. Since now she existed in the world, the redemption of man and the coming of the only begotten of the Father was not longer to be delayed. For now, he would not need to come and live as if by sufferance merely in tents, 2 Kings 7, 6, or in a strange house, but he could enjoy a free welcome as in his temple and as in his own house, one that had been built and enriched at his own preordained expense, more so than the temple of Solomon at the expense of his father David. At the bidding of the divine will, the holy Gabriel presented himself at the foot of the throne, intent upon the immutable essence of the Most High. His majesty then expressly charged him with the message, which he was to bring to the Most Holy Mary, and instructed him in the very words with which he was to salute and address her. Thus the first author of the message was God himself, who formed the exact words in his divine mind, and revealed them to the holy archangel for transmission to the most pure Mary. At the same time the Lord revealed to the holy Prince Gabriel many hidden sacraments concerning the Incarnation. The Blessed Trinity commanded him to betake himself to the heavenly maiden and announced to her that the Lord had chosen her, among women, to be the mother of the eternal word, that she should conceive him in her virginal womb through operation of the Holy Ghost without injury to her virginity. In this and in all the rest of the message, which he was to declare and manifest to this great queen and mistress, the archangel was instructed by the Blessed Trinity itself. The supernal Prince Gabriel, obeying with singular delight the divine command and accompanied by many thousands of most beautiful angels in visible forms, descended from the highest heaven. The appearance of the great prince and legate was that of a most handsome youth of rarest beauty. His face emitted resplendent rays of light. His bearing was grave and majestic, his advance measured his motions composed, his words weighty and powerful. His whole presence displayed a pleasing, kindly gravity, and more of godlike qualities than all the other angels until then seen in visible form by the heavenly mistress. He wore a diadem of exquisite splendor, and his vestments glowed in various colors, full of refulgent beauty. Encased on his breast, he bore a most beautiful cross, disclosing the mystery of the Incarnation, which he had come to announce. All these circumstances were calculated to rivet the affectionate attention of the most prudent queen. The whole of this celestial army, with their princely leader, Holy Gabriel, directed their flight to Nazareth, a town of the province of Galilee, to the dwelling place of Most Holy Mary. This was an humble cottage, and her chamber was a narrow room, 
spare of all those furnishings which are wont to be used by the world in order to hide its own meanness and want of all higher goods. The heavenly mistress was at this time fourteen years, six months, and seventeen days of age, for her birthday anniversary fell on the 8th of September, and six months, seventeen days had passed since that date, when this greatest of all mysteries ever performed by God in this world was enacted in her. The bodily shape of the heavenly queen was well proportioned and taller than is usual with other maidens of her age, yet extremely elegant and perfect in all its parts. Her face was rather more oblong than round, gracious and beautiful, without leanness or grossness, its complexion clear, yet of a slightly brownish hue, her forehead spacious yet symmetrical, her eyebrows perfectly arched, her eyes large and serious, of incredible and ineffable beauty and dove-like sweetness, dark in color with a mixture tending towards green, her nose straight and well-shaped, her mouth small, with red-colored lips, neither too thin nor too thick. All the gifts of nature in her were so symmetrical and beautiful that no other human being ever had the like. To look upon her caused feelings at the same time of joy and seriousness, love and reverential fear. She attracted the heart and yet restrained it in sweet reverence. Her beauty impelled the tongue to sound her praise and yet her grandeur and her overwhelming perfections and graces hushed it to silence. In all that approached her, she caused divine effects not easily explained. She filled the heart with heavenly influences and divine operations, tending toward the divinity. Chapter 11, Mary listens to the message of the holy angel. The mystery of the incarnation is enacted by the conception of the eternal word in her womb. In order that the mystery of the Most High might be fulfilled, the holy angel Gabriel, in the shape described in the preceding chapter, and accompanied by innumerable angels in visible human forms and resplendent with incomparable beauty, entered into the chamber where Most Holy Mary was praying. It was on a Thursday at six o'clock in the evening and at the approach of night. The great modesty and restraint of the Princess of Heaven did not permit her to look at him more than was necessary to recognize him as an angel of the Lord. Recognizing him as such, she, in her usual humility, wished to do him reverence. The Holy Prince would not allow it. On the contrary, he himself bowed profoundly as before his queen and mistress, in whom he adored the heavenly mysteries of his Creator. At the same time, he understood that from that day on, the ancient times and the custom of old, whereby men should worship angels as Abraham had done, Genesis 28.2, were changed. For as human nature was raised to the dignity of God Himself in the person of the Word, men now held the position of adopted children, of companions and brethren of the angels. As the angel said to evangelist St. John, when he refused to be worshipped. The holy archangel saluted our and his queen and said, Ave gratia plena, Dominus tecum benedicta tu in malieribus. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Luke 1, 28. Hearing this new salutation of the angel, this most humble of all creatures was disturbed, but not confused in mind. Luke 1, 29. This disturbance arose from two causes. First, from her humility, for she thought herself the lowest of the creatures and thus, in her humility, was taken unawares at hearing herself saluted and called the blessed among women. Secondly, when she heard the salute and began to consider within herself how she should receive it, she was interiorly made to understand by the Lord that he chose her for his mother and this caused a still greater perturbance, having such a humble opinion of herself. 
On account of this perturbance, the angel proceeded to explain to her the decree of the Lord, saying, Do not fear, Mary, for thou hast found grace before the Lord. Luke 1.30 Behold, thou shalt conceive a son in thy womb, and thou shalt give birth to him, and thou shalt name him Jesus. He shall be great. He shall be called Son of the Most High, and the rest as recorded of the Holy Archangel. Our most prudent and humble queen alone, among all the creatures, was sufficiently intelligent and magnanimous to estimate at its true value such a new and unheard of sacrament. And in proportion, as she realized its greatness, so she was also moved with admiration. But she raised her humble heart to the Lord, who could not refuse her any petition. And in the secret of her spirit, she asked new light and assistance by which to govern herself in such an arduous transaction. For as we have said in the preceding chapter, the Most High, in order to permit her to act in this mystery solely in faith, hope, and charity, left her in the common state and suspended all other kinds of favors and interior elevations, which she so frequently or continually enjoyed. In this disposition, she replied and said to Holy Gabriel, What is written in St. Luke? How shall this happen, that I conceive and bear, since I know not, nor can know, man? At the same time, she interiorly represented to the Lord the vow of chastity which she had made, and the espousal which His Majesty had celebrated with her. The Holy Prince Gabriel replied, Luke 1, 24, Lady, it is easy for the divine power to make thee a mother without the cooperation of man. The Holy Spirit shall remain with thee by a new presence, and the virtue of the Most High shall overshadow thee, so that the Holy of Holies can be born of thee, who shall himself be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth has likewise conceived a son in her sterile years. And this is the sixth month of her conception, for nothing is impossible with God. He that can make her conceive, who was sterile, can bring it about, that thou, lady, be his mother, still preserving thy virginity and enhancing thy purity. To the son whom thou shalt bear, God will give the throne of his father David, and his reign shall be everlasting in the house of Jacob. Thou art not ignorant, O lady, of the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah 7:14, that a virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son, whose name shall be Emmanuel, God with us. This prophecy is infallible, and it shall be fulfilled in thy person. Thou knowest also of the great mystery of the bush, which Moses saw burning without its being consumed by the fire, Exodus 3:2. This signified that the two natures, divine and human, are to be united in such a manner that the latter is not consumed by the divine, and that the mother of the Messiah shall conceive and give birth without violation of her virginal purity. Remember also, lady, the promise of the eternal God to the patriarch Abraham, that after the captivity of his posterity for four generations, they should return to this land. The mysterious signification of which was that in this, the fourth generation. Note, in the autograph manuscript, Mary of Agreda explains this fourth generation as follows. Quote, the mystery of this fourth generation is that there are four generations. First, that of Adam, without a father or mother. Second, that of Eve, without a mother. Third, of our own from a father and mother. Fourth, that of our Lord Jesus Christ from a mother without a father. The incarnate God is to rescue the whole race of Adam through thy cooperation from the oppression of the devil. Genesis 15:16, And the latter which Jacob saw in his sleep, Genesis 28, 12, 
was an express figure of the royal way, which the eternal word was to open up, and by which the mortals are to ascend to heaven, and the angels to descend to earth. To this earth, the only begotten of the Father, shall lower himself in order to converse with the men, and communicate to them the treasures of his divinity, imparting to them his virtues and his immutable and eternal perfections." End quote. Therefore this great lady considered and inspected profoundly the spacious field of the dignity of Mother of God, Proverbs 21.11. In order to purchase it by her fiat, she clothed herself in fortitude more than human, and she tasted and saw how profitable was this enterprise and commerce with the divinity. She comprehended the ways of his hidden benevolence and adorned herself with fortitude and beauty. And having conferred with herself and with the heavenly messenger Gabriel about the grandeur of these high and divine sacraments, and finding herself in excellent condition to receive the message sent to her, her purest soul was absorbed and elevated in admiration, reverence, and highest intensity of divine love. By the intensity of these movements and supernal affections, her most pure heart, as it were by natural consequence, was contracted and compressed with such force that it distilled three drops of her most pure blood, and these, finding their way to the natural place for the act of conception, were formed by the power of the Divine and Holy Spirit into the body of Christ our Lord. Thus the matter from which the most holy humanity of the Word for our redemption is composed was furnished and administered by the most pure heart of Mary and through the sheer force of her true love. At the same moment, with a humility never sufficiently to be extolled, inclining slightly her head and joining her hands, she pronounced these words, which were the beginning of our salvation. Fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum. Let it be unto me according to thy word. Luke 1, 31. At the pronouncing of this fiat, so sweet to the hearing of God and so fortunate for us, in one instant, four things happened. First, the most holy body of Christ our Lord was formed from the three drops of blood furnished by the heart of most holy Mary. Secondly, the most holy soul of the same Lord was created, just as the other souls. Thirdly, the soul and the body united in order to compose his perfect humanity. Fourthly, the divinity united itself in the person of the Word with the humanity, which together became one composite being in hypostatical union, and thus was formed Christ, true God and man, our Lord and Redeemer. This happened in springtime on the 25th of March, at break or dawning of the day, in the same hour, in which our first father Adam was made, and in the year of the creation of the world, 5199, which agrees also with the count of the Roman Church in her martyrology, under the guidance of the Holy Ghost. This reckoning is the true and certain one, as was told me, when I inquired at command of my superiors. Conformable to this, the world was created in the month of March, which corresponds to the beginning of creation. And as the works of the Most High are perfect and complete, Deuteronomy 32.4, the plants and trees come forth from the hands of His Majesty bearing fruit, and they would have borne them continually without intermission if sin had not changed the whole nature, as I will expressly relate in another treatise, if it is the will of the Lord. Now, however, I will not detain myself therewith, since it does not pertain to our subject. Instruction of the Most Holy Queen Mary. My daughter, thou art filled with astonishment at seeing, by means of new light, the mystery of the humiliation of the divinity and uniting himself with the human nature in the womb of a poor maiden such as I was. 
I wish, however, my dearest, that thou turn thy attention toward thyself and consider how God humiliated himself and came into my womb, not only for myself alone, but for thee as well. The Lord is infinite in his mercy and his love has no limit. And thus he attends and esteems and assists every soul who receives him and he rejoices in it as if he had created it alone and as if he had been made man for it alone. Therefore, with all the affection of thy soul, thou must, as it were, consider thyself as being thyself in person bound to render the full measure of thanks of all the world for his coming, and for his coming to redeem all. And if, with a lively faith, thou art convinced and confesseth that the same God who, infinite in his attributes and eternal in his majesty, lowered himself to assume human flesh in my womb, seeks also thee, calls thee, rejoices thee, caresses thee, and thinks of thee alone, as if thou wert his only creature. Galatians 2.20 Think well and reflect to what his admirable condescension obliges thee. Convert this admiration into living acts of faith and love. For that he condescends to come to thee, thou owest entirely to the goodness of the King and Savior, since thou thyself couldst never find him nor attain him. Here ends the reading. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.